So we'll get started here and I'll just cut that, that earlier section off. Um, so, hey, Bowtie Nation, this is Joe Hoke. Thanks for joining us for another one of these weekly market updates, trying to do these every other week, uh, 9 a.m. Eastern time, uh, just kind of what I'm watching in the market, kind of a topic for the market. Uh, great topic this week about the stock market crash, right? Because we've seen the market is now up. The market just had its best month since November 2020. Okay, that's 19 months. A best month in 19 months was up 9% in July. It was actually up uh, almost 5% last last week alone. Okay, and there's only been 10 weeks out of the out of the last 260 out of the last five five uh, years that the market has been up so much uh, in a single week. And four of them were up this this year. Right, so definitely, uh, definitely some opportunities there. That broader index, the S&P 500, is now up 13.6% from its June lows. Okay, so almost 14% up from the uh, from the bottom. The Nasdaq, tech-heavy Nasdaq, for its part, is up 17% from the June lows. Uh, and, and now, you know, the uh, I think the S&P was only down about 14% from its peak in January. So, so you got to be asking yourself: uh, Is the stock market crash over? Uh, we're seeing continuously, we're seeing worse economic news. The uh, the U.S. actually just reported its second consecutive quarter of falling GDP, falling econ economy uh, last quarter. You know, it was down, uh, it was down, I think, 0.6 percent. It was down 1.6 percent in the first quarter, which for a lot of people is that that two two quarters in a row that uh, that rule of thumb for a recession. Uh, now, obviously, that's not the official definition of a recession set by the uh, the NBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research. They're actually the government body that says, OK, you know, officially we started a recession last year or or whenever. And it ended this year. And they look at a little bit more than just that just that GDP. But come on, for all of us out there, we know it feels like a recession, right? With uh, prices going up way more than the wages are going up, we're starting to see uh, slower job growth and and jobs coming down. So you know, it is uh, it is no doubt about it. We are in or or very close to heading into a recession. So you know, you got to look at that. Uh, and uh, I'm going to detail you know what kind of the the bull and bear uh, factors in this market and why. Even though I'm still skeptical about the market, I still think we do we do fall back down, and uh, especially even even close to those lows, if not below the the lows we hit in June, you can't just sit out the market. You can't be all in cash. You can't sell your stocks. Uh, so I'm going to share a, a an investing strategy that you can use to get really the best of both worlds. That barbell strategy where you do have uh, you do have the opportunity to to make uh, make money in these rallies. But then you have money set aside uh, for you know for for better opportunities if stocks do continue to fall further. Uh, stick around though, because just after that, obviously we'll have our, our weekly market update, all the stock market news, trends, strategies, stocks I'm watching this week, uh, and all that. So stick around for that, and then we'll have Q and A, of course. Uh, I do want to invite you before we get started to uh, sign up for the weekly bow tie. This is our free weekly newsletter. Goes out Sunday night before the market opens. Uh, really, everything I'm watching in the market, everything, I, a lot of stuff that we talk about in these Monday market, Monday morning live streams, uh, the sectors, the trends, the strategies, and the stocks I'm watching. Uh, I put a link there in the chat. I'll also put it in the description below. Uh, totally free. You know, just something I like to do for all you out there in the community. So, so go ahead and look for that. Click through that and sign up, and, and you'll be able to, uh, to to get it to get some of that. But I do want to get started because, uh, again, you know, I see a lot of questions. Uh, is the bull market crash over? Uh, what to do? How to invest in that? Uh, and whether whether I think that you know the market could fall further. Um, and again, you know, best quarter uh, or best month in, in almost two years, uh, despite some of the stuff that we'll talk about, despite the fact that the Federal Reserve has just started hiking rates. They, in fact, they hiked uh, another 0.75 percent last week. That was the second one in a row. Uh, and they haven't hiked interest rates that much, uh, 75 basis points since like 1994. So this is back to back interest rate hikes. Uh, we again, we're talking about lower corporate earnings. Uh, we'll look at that in a little bit. Uh, weakening housing market. Anyone that's been looking for at houses like like myself, uh, you know, actually getting ready to move to Tampa here in a month, less than a month, actually into this month, we're going to be moving. Uh, and we've been looking at houses for the last two years and seeing those house prices just rise ridiculously high up, like 40% over the last two years. 
and now we're actually starting to see price cuts. We're actually starting to see a lot of these houses for sale that are coming down twelve, fifteen, twenty-five thousand uh, dollars on a lot of these houses. So we are seeing a very much a weakening housing market. Actually, read a, a report this morning on Bloomberg that house prices, the the increase in prices, have actually uh, actually fell f by the most on on record. You know, they fell two percent. Um, you know, slower growth, not necessarily the prices came down, but prices last month, prices were up 19% on a year over year basis. This uh, in July, they were only up 17%. So they're down 2% that growth down 2% in one month alone. And that was actually by this mortgage, uh, mortgage researcher was the most in that they had fallen in history. But you know, we're just getting started on those uh, so there seems to be a disconnect from the, the stock market, what it's doing, and that real economic backdrop that we're looking at. So uh, obviously the stock market is not the economy, but it is tied to the economy. You cannot deny that uh, you know the economy, how it affects corporate earnings, and how corporate earnings actually play into stock market valuations over the long term. That is the real basis for uh, for investing. Okay, those you, when you buy a stock, you have a share of those corporate earnings. Uh, so you know wherever those corporate earnings go those earnings and that profitability goes that's where your stock goes you know over the longer run obviously you know any any short term period a, a year or less it's going to be a much more investor sentiment and uh, and that kind of thing so uh, you know I, I mean I will admit I've been caught off guard by the strength in this rally the strength over the last month um, it is now like we said it's now up about 14% from its uh, from its lows uh, and we're going to actually get two key tests here in the next two weeks. One is this Friday with the jobs report, right? And, and so let, let me back up and say, okay, why why has the market been rallying so strong? Why is the market up almost 14% from its uh, June lows? And a lot of it is based on the idea of a Fed pivot, okay? The, a pivot in the language of the Fed in how it's rate, increasing interest rates, right? And the Fed, the Federal Reserve Chair Powell and all the members, they've been really, really explicit about what they're planning on doing. They said they were going to front load the interest rate hikes, right? They did 75 basis points, 0.75% in the last two months or in the last two meetings, really raising those rates fast. And then they're going to take a wait and see, slow down approach, right? So we're actually only expecting in the September meeting of the Fed, we're actually only expecting a half a percent increase. Uh, and that's very likely what we'll get unless we get some very different uh, economic data. We're expecting, uh, you know, another interest rate increase later on in the year uh, till uh, and the market is really expecting, you know, December to really be the last of uh, the last interest rate increase. And what investors are looking at here and talking about with that Fed pivot is that, yes, we are starting to see inflation come or we're expecting to see inflation come down. And we're going to talk about that. We're expecting to see lower jobs growth, you know, weaker employment in, uh, situation. Uh, and for that, you know, if we do see the economy start weakening, if we do see inflation start coming down, then the Fed can can uh, you know slow down its interest rates hikes. That's going to slow down the effect on the economy, right? Because the Fed increases interest rates, they slow down the economy. That brings inflation down. Uh, if inflation is starting to come down, the Fed doesn't have to be quite so aggressive in those interest rate hikes. Okay. So the market is saying, you know what, we're through the worst of the interest rate hikes. Maybe the Fed will start slowing down. And so I'm going to get back in stocks because, you know, stocks do well when the Fed is, is, not, is not raising interest rates, right? So that's, that's really why, why we've jumped so much off of those June lows. Um, again, the key test will be this Friday with that, Fed, with that July jobs report. Uh, the market is actually expecting the U.S. to have added 250,000 jobs here in the last month. That would be down from about 370,000 jobs added in the month before. And obviously, you know, uh, I think this is something like two, two years plus of uh, very high jobs growth, a very strong la labor market. So if we do see some weakness in the jobs market, uh, you know, employment, unemployment ticking up a little bit, then again, that would be a sign to the market that, uh, you know, that the economy is slowing down and the Fed can slow down on its rate hikes. Uh, so in, in this case, it would be something like a bad news is actually good news for the stock market, right? Because a bad news for the labor market, slowing jobs market would actually mean that, uh, you know, the, the economy is slowing down enough that maybe inflation could start coming down and the Fed can st slow down as well. And folks, let's be clear about it. That is the only way we get inflation down is to get a weaker jobs market. Okay, if we continue to see very strong jobs growth, uh, which I think that 250,000 jobs added after almost 400,000 in the month before, uh, even though we have heard a lot of companies say they're going to slow jobs, slow hiring, they're going to uh, slow down the jobs growth at their companies. 
that 250,000 is very low. And there is a good chance that we beat that number. We come in above those expectations yet again for the jobs market. Jobs market has proven extremely resilient over the last year. Um, so if we do get higher jobs, uh, jobs added than we expected, that good news would actually be bad news for the market again. Because remember, uh, you know, that would mean that the jobs market is just not cooling down as fast as maybe the Fed would like or people are expecting. And the Fed would have to reconsider uh, those interest rate hikes and being still being more aggressive. So that is going to come on Friday. It's going to be a big day for the markets. Obviously, uh, the market's got you know four days until then, uh, as well as a lot of earnings that we're going to talk about. It's coming up on the 12th. Then the next key key uh, key element of this is going to be that CPI report, right? The Consumer Price Index. Okay, that's going to come, uh, you know, here around the 12th. The, the government always reports that it was 9.6 percent last month, uh, largely because of the higher gas prices. You know that uh, that that. that factored into that. Now, there is it's very likely, it's almost a guarantee, almost assured that inflation is going to show lower on that report when we get it on the 12th, right? Because gas prices have come down so much. And a lot of these other commodity prices have come down just in the last month, month and a half. Um, so that will be uh, that will be a, a good sign that, that inflation is starting to come down. Of course, investors are going to have to look at that core number uh, that strips out food and, and energy prices that are a little bit more volatile, and uh, really kind of make the decision whether you know core inflation, that real inflation, is coming down. And, and I do think you know we do start seeing a kind of a moderation in inflation a little bit, but I th still think it's going to be very much more persistent than the Fed or the economists believe. Okay, and what I'm talking about here, something we've been talking about over the last. Uh, over the last several months, really, is housing and rentals, okay, rental prices. If you look at how much house prices have increased over the last two years, I'm like 30, 40% in most markets, uh, rent prices just have not kept up, okay? Rent prices, landlords, uh, you know, for the longest time, they couldn't evict people, so they weren't going to raise the rent uh, and then and just not get anything, okay? So they were keeping the rent pretty much static. Rent prices did not keep up with house prices over the last couple of years. They're just now starting to raise those rents, right? Uh, I saw some, some, some evidence that rent prices in a lot of the U.S. rose like 10%. Over the last year, uh, which is more than that, that uh, you know, more than that base inflation that we saw in the consumer price index. Um, so landlords are just now starting to raise their rents to keep to get back up with those house prices, right? If you know they, they've got to be stabilized because you know if house prices increase so much, but landlords can't get uh, much out of their rent, they're just going to sell the house. You know, it's 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 more profitable for them to to just sell than have to rent at these lower rates. So landlords have to raise those rates to catch up with the increase in house prices. And they're just doing that. They're doing that gradually. Uh, and that's 30% of the CPI, of the consumer price index, right? So what we're going to see, I think, over the next year even, is that at, because those that rent, uh, because that rent uh, inflation is going to be so much higher than, uh, than, than the rest, even, even as the economy slows down, these uh, you know, house prices are still fairly high and landlords are raising those rents uh, because that is going to be so persistent. It is going to hold up inflation much higher than I think the rest of the market realizes. So you know, here, here on the 12th, when we do get that CPI report, it's going to show lower inflation. I think that's going to, that's going to uh, cheer the markets. You know, the investors are going to see lower inflation. I think the Fed is going to be able to slow down. And, and I think, we, you know, we, there is a good chance that we do get, you know, this market rally to continue a little bit longer. Uh, but I, I think the risk is to later on in the year when we realize that inflation isn't coming down like we thought it would. You know, it came down last month just because of the gas prices and things like that. But it's not coming down like we thought it would. And the Fed is going to have to continue to be aggressive on those rates. So, you know, again, we talked about bear market rallies, how to invest in those, what those are in a video uh, a while ago. Check that out. Uh, some of the other things I want to cover on why I'm kind of skeptical about this is uh, if we do look in inflation also and, and these earnings, you look at these earnings and uh, companies are reporting amazing sales growth. Okay, Procter & Gamble, consumer staples, uh, you make toothpaste and stuff like that, reported their best organic sales growth, their best revenue growth year over year basis in more than 20 years. Uh, they just started, started uh, collecting that data for organic sales growth in like 2002, 2001. 
Um, so, and, and they reported the highest ever there. So maybe more than 20 years, 10% sales growth. And I don't know about you, but I'm not buying any more tooth, any more toothpaste than I was, you know, a year ago. I'm buying the same amount, right? So if they're, if they're collecting 10% higher sales, um, then it's because they're raising prices by 10% plus. In fact, I think they, they reported lower volume. So lower amounts of, uh, uh, lower quantity sold, but they're raising prices so much that they are, uh, they're collecting that much more money, higher sales growth. Across the S&P 500, so across the 500 largest companies in, in America, sales growth is 12% on a year-over-year -year basis, which is huge. Uh, I mean, over the, past, uh, over the past decade, that's been closer to maybe 5%, 6% at the most. So this is like double sales growth. And, uh, and earnings growth of only 6%, right? So the sales growth is so high, uh, earnings are only 6% higher. And why? Because companies, one, they're passing on some of those inflation costs to customers. They're raising their prices that much uh, to cover some of that inflation, but they're not covering all the inflation. Okay, They're only, they're only able to turn this 12% sales growth into 6% earnings growth, right? They're eating a lot of those extra costs uh, and they're not gonna do that forever. You know, Companies wanna get back to that, that same level of profitability, so they're gonna continue to raise those prices. And I think this just feeds into a cycle where companies raise their prices for goods, workers say, hey, you know, I got less money, I gotta ask my employer for a raise uh, uh, yet again. You know, I asked for the raise last year, I, I need another raise to cover more toothpaste, right? The, the higher cost of toothpaste, uh, just the bare necessities. Um, so you get people asking for higher wages, that feeds into company costs, and they have to raise their prices to cover those costs. And so it's just just kind of a cycle, right? As the landlords raise their rents, as the uh, the companies raise their prices, and, and things like that, right? So this tells me that the corporate earnings, you know, are the profitability, uh, and that that ultimate value of stocks is going to be under pressure uh, for, you know, at least another six months to a year. Okay. As we start see, as we see companies try to pass on more of that inflation through higher costs, but still have to eat some of that, uh, that profitability, those earnings are going to be lower, lower than expected. You know, that's going to disappoint. Uh, and we're going to see, we're going to see inflation consistently, uh, consistently higher. Uh, against all this, you know, uh, and I want to, uh, I want to look at a few graphs here. Uh, Against all this, earnings just have not come down. Okay, this is from Fact Set Earnings Insight. Uh, this is the analyst expectations for earnings of companies in the S&P 500. Okay, so this is 2022. So this is this year, and then next year, the bottom uh, the bottom one is 2022. So you can see here, since uh, since July of last year, this is what analysts, this is what Wall Street expected companies in the S&P 500 to earn. Uh, you know, for this year, for 2022, and it's tre it trended up. You know, trended up all the way to about two hundred and thirty dollars uh, till the beginning of this or to June, to yeah, to June of this year. And then analysts started saying, "Hey, we're in a recession. We don't think companies are going to start are going to be making as much money this year as we thought." So they've since that cut that down to about two hundred twenty seven dollars. That is, you know, that's this, that's this part right here. Two hundred twenty seven dollars. Wall Street now expects uh, earnings out of the S&P 500 for this year, but it's only come down from 230. Okay, so that is a very low. That is less than a percent uh, decrease from what uh, from what they expected earlier in the year. Now let's look at uh, this th this next year. Analyst expectations for next year are now 245 dollars for companies in the S&P 500. And again, folks, remember these are these are earnings. These are what you own as a stock investor. You own a share of these earnings. Uh, and that's the ultimate value in stocks. So it's really when you're looking at the price to earnings, price to earnings ratio, valuation in stocks. This is what it's based off of is what these companies report in earnings. And uh, you can see here for this 2023 for next year, analysts were expecting, uh, you know, all the way from July of last year, expecting earnings to do really well to keep growing. You know, uh, they raised their earnings expectations until uh, just mid this year. And then they again, they started saying, OK, you know what? Companies are telling us inflation is hitting their bottom line. Uh, they're not able to pass on all those costs. That peaked at about $251 that they expected companies to report next year, 2023. And that has come down since to 245. But that is still not nearly enough. Analysts on Wall Street still expect companies in the S&P 500 to report $245 in earnings uh, for those 500 companies. $245 per share against $227 this year. So earnings growth from this year to next year. Uh, now the problem there is that this is, you know, that's not what we see in a recession. 
in a recession, here's some uh, here's the data from Deloitte all the way back to 1948, all these recessions here since 1948, Deloitte uh, reports that corporate earnings have fallen between 10 to 20 percent. Okay, so you can see this line here, uh, and every all of these uh, all of these shaded areas are recessions. You can see how much corporate earnings fell in each of these, and it's always at least 10 percent. Right, so corporate earnings have have fallen 20, 10 to twenty percent in all of these are uh, all these recessions. Two thousand eight recession that fell thirty percent. Corporate earnings fell thirty percent in that last big recession. And so, what would that mean? Okay, if corporate corporations in the S and P five hundred are expected to report, you know, right around two hundred twenty seven, two hundred thirty dollars in earnings this year, and we are in a in a recession. What does that mean for earnings next year? They can't grow to two hundred forty five dollars. There's just no way in hell. Uh, so I think uh, you know Wall Street investors are still delusional about how much you know money corporations are going to make and report over this next year. We're starting to see obviously with these earnings reports, companies coming out trying to guide those expectations lower, um, you know, but they just haven't done it quite enough yet. So I think I think uh, Wall Street really still has to wake up to the fact that uh, earnings are going to be lower and stocks need to adjust lower for that. Another chart here I'm looking at, uh, so PE ratios, uh, price to earnings ratios, this is actually the Ford price to earnings ratio. So this is the current price of stocks in each of these sectors, and we can look at these, uh, but the current price of stocks in each of these sectors of the economy, as well as the S&P 500, the stock market, divided by the earnings that analysts expect over the next year. And you can see, so this uh, the dark blue line is the current, the green line is the 10-year average. And you can see, uh, you know, a lot of these, some of, some of these are still looking are looking pretty good with the blue line under the uh, the green line, right? The blue line. So for example, if we look at here, financials. Financials here is uh, trading at 12.1 times on a PE basis. Uh, and over the last 10 years, it's averaged 12.9 times, right? So it's actually selling at a discount right now to those earnings that are expected over the next year. Um, but if we look at most of the market still, you know, the S&P 500 right here is trading right, right around at the, uh, at the average. Okay, we got 17.1 times on a PE basis right now for stocks in the S&P 500 and 17 times average over the last 10 years. Okay, so stocks are no longer cheap. Okay, for a little bit there, it, for a little bit there in June, the PE ratio was uh, below that 10-year average. Stocks were looking cheap. They're not looking that way anymore. In fact, you got some some sectors, consumer discretionary, all the way over here at the right or at the left, trading for 25 times on a forward PE basis, over 21.9 times on that 10-year average. Right. So stocks still looking extremely, ex or not extremely expensive, but still looking pretty expensive uh, on that basis. Um, if we look at the stock market here, and, and I'm going to talk about kind of how to invest, how to play this here in a little bit. But if you just look at some of the technical ba technical factors, this is the uh, S&P 500, this stock chart right here, and you can see those those June lows and how that's uh, started to come back up. You know, since June, it's up 14% from the June lows. And down here is the RSI, the Relative Strength Indicator. Now this is, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a big technical uh, investor, a technical trader. I don't follow a lot of the technical signals, but this is one that I really do follow for that short-term sentiment and for those short-term ideas, right? Because the RSI, it really measures how stocks have uh, have sold off or, or, or are overbought, right? The RSI shows you, uh, you know, stock market, uh, on average, over the you know over the past 14 days, over the past different periods, uh, whether stocks are kind of technically oversold or overbought, you know what whether investor sentiment is a little bit ahead of itself or uh, maybe selling off. And so you can see here, whenever whenever the RSI reaches 30, then we say that stocks are oversold or a stock or the index. And we've seen that a couple of times. You know we've seen that a couple of times here this year. And uh, and when that happens, you tend to get those bear market rallies. Okay, we saw that here in late January, and we got a, a rally here in February. We saw that here in uh, late February, early March, and we had that big, big March rally after the uh, the Fed meeting right there. We saw it again here in May, uh, May, into May or April and May, and we had that rally into uh, into June before we hit those lows. But again, you know what we talked about in that bear market rally video 
is that uh, you get these rallies you get because stocks get oh, so oversold. Investors just rush out of the market, they sell everything, they panic, uh, and stocks get oversold on that short-term technical basis. Uh, and, and you get these rallies, right? You, you get the investors saying, hey, stocks are just too cheap right now. I'm gonna take a chance, I'm gonna buy in. And, and you know the market does rally five, 10% even, and 14% so far we've seen since June. Uh, but then the fundamental factors, the big, the big universal picture hasn't changed. Okay, this, the, the Fed is still raising rates aggressively, in fact, is still expected to raise rates by at least a percent for the rest of the year. Uh, the jobs market is just now starting to slow down. The housing market is weakening further. Uh, so the, that big picture just really hasn't come down enough to really tell me that, hey, you know, we are, we are all clear. We are ready to go back into the next bull market. Stocks aren't cheap, right? So, you know, bringing the, all of this together, uh, again, I don't, think, I don't think you can sit out the market because, you know, we've already, you, you would have already missed out on 70% increase in stocks in the NASDAQ, 14% in the S&P 500. Uh, and, and what the worst thing you can do is to sit out the market, to sell all your stocks and then watch it, watch it increase, you know, that 10 or 15% in a bear market rally and then uh, start getting nervous, right? Start thinking, okay, well, maybe we are in the next bull market. Now I'm going to buy in after the stock market has already rebounded, you know, 10, 14, 10, 15% uh, and then it crashes again. Right, so not only did you miss out on that 10 or 15 percent, but now you bought in at those higher prices, and now you're going to start seeing your stocks fall again. So that's the worst thing you can do. The best thing you can do is what I like, what I've been using uh, over this last really six months, and what I like to use is more of a, of a barbell strategy. Right. Uh, so okay, so I want to back up here. I want to cover one more, one more graph. Uh, kind of look, look at uh, Wall Street expectations. Okay, I know a lot of you been asking, uh, you know, been asking about Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs. You know, if uh, if I'm still hesitant about the stock market, why do uh, why do why do all of these big banks have uh, you know so much higher so much higher um, estimates or expectations for year end targets? And of course, you know, all these analysts they are always overly bullish. Okay, these these analysts you got to understand something about uh, stock market analysts, Wall Street. Uh, it makes more money off of investment banking, off of bond sales, off a lot of this other stuff than it ever does off of trading, off of uh, investors and that kind of thing. So it has to be bullish on stocks. Wall Street analysts have to be bullish uh, on these companies so that those companies give them, give the Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, give uh, JP Morgan their business in investment uh, bond trading and things like that. Um, it's just it's just how it is. You know, it's kind of the lie that, that goes on in Wall Street that everybody kind of turns a blind eye to. So understand when you see these end of year targets, when you see these uh, price targets for companies, they are always going to be very optimistic. Okay, Wall Street never sees a recession, never sees a, uh, you know, a stock market crash coming until it's already already here. Okay, now we do see so these are the uh, about 12, 10 or 12 uh, Wall Street banks where their end of year target is for the year. So we see the uh, the S and P right here. S and P twenty uh, that was horrible. <laughs> we see the uh, the target end of year twenty twenty two S and P five hundred target for these banks right here. We see uh, Bank of America. I've, I've sorted it from lowest to highest. So Bank of America Merrill Lynch has the lowest target thirty six hundred, which would actually about be about thirteen percent lower. So Bank of America is actually a pretty bearish on the rest of the market. I would actually put myself probably close to that, maybe 3,500, 3,400 uh, on the S&P 500. I think, again, I think we, we hit these lower lows once the market realizes that uh, we have not factored in how bad earnings are gonna get and how bad this recession is gonna get. Uh, but Bank of America is the low there. You've got some other ones. JP Morgan here with 4,900 is the highest. So JP Morgan Chase analysts there uh, think the, the market can reach 4,900, which would actually be 18% higher from here. Uh, but the median target is about 4,300 on the S&P 500. That's, that's just a little bit above where we are right now. So the median target, 4,300 for the S&P 500 uh, for the end of the year. So that's, uh, that's, that's kind of some, you know, sorry about that. Here we are. The, uh, the, here's the analyst estimates, right? So you've got, uh, you've got the 2022 S&P 500 targets right here up at the top, this uh, middle column. 3,600 for Bank of America Merrill Lynch. They're, they're the low low target right here. Uh, you've got 4,900 for JP Morgan. And then the rest of these are somewhere in between. 4,300 is gonna be your 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 mid, midpoint here. 
Uh, Barclays 4,500. BMO is is pretty bullish here at 4,800. Uh, City Citigroup 4,200. So they're uh, they're right about around where the median is, as is Credit Suisse. Uh, who else we got here? Goldman Sachs sees the market at 4,300 for uh, at the end of the year. Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley's been one of the most bearish, but actually is it's interesting here that they they have actually raised their target. I think uh, you know over the last month to 3,900. So that is uh, that is still about uh, about three or four percent below where we're at right now, but not nearly as bearish as Bank of America we see up here. Uh, RBS at 4,200 and UBS at 4,150. So again, I want to uh, you know I want to talk about that barbell strategy, how to invest in this environment when you know you're skeptical uh, of this bear market rally, but you don't want to sit it out because again, if you sit out this rally, you miss out on uh, what when it becomes the next bull market. Okay, so again, what I'm doing is is I've got a heavy it's a barbell and think of a barbell where you've got the two heavy sides on the ends and really kind of nothing nothing in between. Okay, so on the one side, I've got uh, growth stocks. I've got stocks that are going to do very well in a stock market rally. Okay, you've got your growth stocks that have sold off so hard, the stocks in the NASDAQ, things like that, that have, uh, that have sold off so much over the last six months, really over the last year, um, that really rebound. Okay, you know, I'm up something like uh, something like 20, 25% in PayPal just over the last month. Uh, some of these other stocks, I, I know, um, you know, SoFi Technologies is up strong over the last uh, over the last month. Things like that, you know, those growth stocks. Uh, on the other side, though, you've got cash and cash-like investments. You've got those I bonds that we've been talking about. You've got even even some shorter-term bonds and cash. I'm about 30% of my portfolio in those right now, and then very much heavily uh, heavily concentrated on growth stocks for the rest. And what this does is obviously, you know, in a bear, in a in a rally, you know, stocks are up 14, 17% over the last month. Those growth stocks are going to do even better. Like we said, 20, 25% in a lot of those growth stocks. So that part of your portfolio is going to do really well if the rally continues. Uh, but you know, if the rally does fall apart, if it proves to be just another bear market rally, then uh, then you want some protection. You want some opportunity to buy in stocks at lower prices. So that's why you have the cash. That's why you have that that big that big chunk of cash, I bonds, cash like investments here on the other side of your portfolio uh, to really you know to really balance out this weighting of growth stocks on the other side. Now understand, this is going to be a very hard strategy for value investors, for dividend investors, for anyone that likes to invest in those those kind of in between uh, stocks, right? Because value, uh, dividend stocks, things like that, they aren't going to rise as much as the rest of the market. Those safety stocks, the stocks in consumer staples, the stocks in utilities, uh, in healthcare, a lot of those stocks. Aren't going to rise as much with the rally, you know, when uh, you know when it does rally, when the, when the market rallies, okay, like your growth stocks, uh, but they're not going to necessarily protect you very much if the stock market does crash again, if it does fall fall lower, okay. So it's kind of a middle of the road, you know, middle of the road kind of investment. That's fine for long term. You know, if you are a dividend investor, if you are a value investor, and you just you just want to concentrate on that section of the market, uh, get those long term returns, those long term cash flow with your dividends. That's fine. But if you are kind of worried about this market, uh, you know, worried that it might fall further, but still want to stay invested somewhat and take advantage of the rally, then this barbell strategy is going to help you help you the most. It's going to help you do that. Okay, so a little bit overweight, overexposure on growth stocks on one end, but still keeping that that cash and those cash-like investments on the other to kind of balance out your barbell there, okay? That's really, uh, you know, that's really how to play these, these, these hesitant or, or skeptical markets uh, like we've seen. Now, I do, want to, uh, I do want to turn it over to our weekly stock market, uh, stock market update. This is where I'm going to cover all the stocks I'm watching, the stocks, uh, stock news for the week. And, uh, and we're going to start with stocks, stocks to watch here. We've got 152 stocks in the S&P 500, so a third of the market is going to be reporting its earnings this week. Uh, the really one of the biggest weeks after last week, really one of the biggest weeks in earnings. Uh, so going to be a big week. Now, the thing about that is, uh, you know, stocks have been reporting very good earnings uh, over the last uh, over the last couple of months, uh, or over the last month, over the last few weeks for second quarter. Uh, the market has mostly cheered those earnings. Uh, the uh, the again sales uh, sales growth has been through the roof almost 13% for the S&P 500 
uh, earnings have been about a 6% higher on a year over year basis. And so, you know, I don't see really uh, much of that changing. Um, I, I think stocks are going to continue to to really report better than expected second quarter earnings. That's going to cheer the market, at least until Friday when we get that jobs report. But a couple of stocks just to watch here, uh, watching Mosaic, it's going to report its earnings today, actually Monday. Uh, and, and, you know, fertilizer prices have fallen through, you know, just fallen through the floor uh, over the last couple of months. We had that huge spike in fertilizer prices there uh, on the Ukraine conflict, you know, on the idea that uh, we weren't going to see a lot of those grain shipments out of Ukraine. Uh, but then uh, these, these, these shares and fertilizer prices have come down quite a bit. You can see here uh, they peaked there about $78, $80 there in April and have just crashed since then. They're down about 33% from this year's peak and actually now starting to look really attractive on that long-term theme because you know whether or not uh, fertilizer prices fall during any given year they are they are rising over the longer term because we need more fertilizer right uh, the only way we feed the 8 billion people that are in the world today uh, that are eating more meat and needing more uh, you know needing more more grains produced uh, the only way we do that is to increase the crop yield. Okay, we aren't getting we aren't getting any more land, any more agricultural land, uh, you know, for 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 growing or for planting. Uh, we have to increase that crop yield to be able to grow more crops, right? So so over the long term, that just means more fertilizer demand. Uh, there are some other you know intricacies uh, uh, within the, the the fertilizer market that is holding prices down. But uh, but this is a long term story. OK, so I think right now, you know, you look at a 33 percent drop in shares of Mosaic, some of these other fertilizer producers uh, since their peak this year. And I think it's it's a good long term theme to uh, to to invest in good attractive valuations anyway. PayPal. PayPal is going to report its earnings on Tuesday. Uh, it's down 56% so far this year, but up 26% over the last month. We just talked about that, how these growth stocks are rebounding very strongly into the market. Uh, it looks like it's going to be about flat. Uh, actually, market just opened. PayPal is flat, uh, but it's going to report its earnings tomorrow. Uh, company is being targeted by an activist investor, though. Elliott Management got a big boost last week from the disclosure for that. Uh, they wouldn't say how big the uh, the, the position is, but they are going to be pushing uh, PayPal to really unlock some of the shareholder value. Uh, I highlighted PayPal as actually one of my largest holdings earlier this year. Uh, shares shares are down, but you know just through do dollar cost averaging, my position is only down about 20% to the last week's close. And, and again, folks, I think you know PayPal for that for that digital wallet space. Is probably the best uh, the best positioned growth stock here for the next ten years. Okay, we are increasingly thinking about our money in terms of zeros and ones instead of cash, right? We are increasingly going to be using those digital wallets. And what I've been talking about with PayPal, if you watch uh, if you watch the video on uh, PayPal that I did uh, earlier this year, you'll see that okay, these digital wallets that PayPal owns, that Square owns. They're just not monetizing them like they should or like they could eventually. They are using uh, using these for transactional. They're getting some payment fees from these digital wallets. But what these digital wallets could become is an all-inclusive financial, uh, you know, just a, a financial bank, right? They could be using these these digital wallets for to sell insurance, to sell um, investments, insurance, to sell uh, everything, basically everything you do with your traditional bank, to do mortgage loans, to do other loans. Uh, and, and they're just not doing that yet. So once uh, once PayPal and Square and these other digital wallets really moves into from a customer acquisition uh, process, right? Right now, they're just trying to get more customers in these digital wallets. They're not really focusing on monetization and making money off these customers. Once they make that transition over this next five to 10 years, um, they are going to start making a lot more money and, and a lot more profits off of these uh, off of this space. I think digital wallets, you know, PayPal's digital wallet alone could be worth more than, you know, three, three to five times more than the whole company is valued at right now. Right now, it's only about a hundred billion dollar company. The, the, the digital wallet section of that is maybe about 20 billion. Uh, I think that that alone, that 20 billion alone could be, you know, two or 300 billion uh, valuation right there. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm again, I continue to dollar cost average into PayPal uh, and uh, and watching, uh, you know, watching that stock, especially earnings tomorrow. Uh, Booking Holdings. Booking Holdings is expected to uh, report $17 and about 50 cents per share when it reports on Wednesday. 
uh, likely to beat those estimates. Travel has been extremely strong, even though, uh, you know, of course, the airlines are kicking people off the flights and canceling flights right and left. Uh, full year earnings are expected to be up 45% from last year and 58% growth in revenue, right? So booking holdings, uh, as well as a lot of these online travel agencies, these travel websites uh, continues to continue to, to, to look pretty good. Uh, more than that, though, I think Really, if you're if you're investing in any of the airlines, American Airlines, uh, Southwest, any of those, you really need to be watching booking holdings uh, and some of these other uh, you know travel agencies, these travel websites, uh, to kind of a preview in airline stocks because airline stocks typically report their earnings later on in the earnings calendar. So so next week and the following weeks, you'll see those those airline stocks report their earnings. You're really going to get a preview from that uh, here in, with booking holdings, Alibaba. Uh, Alibaba up today. Uh, it was down big last week, down like 11% uh, just Friday alone. Uh, the company was the latest to get a, a warning, a delisting warning from the SEC. So again, this is something we've been covering. Following on the channel, uh, the changes to the SEC rules about you know, foreign stocks that can be listed on the US exchanges say that those foreign stocks, those foreign companies have to be uh, their auditor have to, has to be open to an audit from the PCAOB, which is a U.S. Uh, a U.S. accounting board uh, that audits the auditors. Basically, well, that's not possible with Chinese stocks. So a lot of these Chinese stocks are getting delisting warnings. They could get delisted from the U.S. exchanges. So that that really hit the stock uh, last last week. Uh, I actually uh, invested in Alibaba around February of this year, about eighty-one dollars per share. So I'm up just a little bit now. Uh, it's since come down. It's it was it touched one hundred and fifty dollars a share uh, just a couple of months ago. It's come down quite a bit over the last. And I think to to understand these, you know, uh, Alibaba did come out and say uh, over the weekend that it was going to fight and and try to say stay listed on the U.S. exchange. So it is going to try to get that accounting oversight to where it can stay listed on the U.S. exchange. Uh, but for reference here, I think you just you got to look at DD Global, right? Ticker DIDIY, and uh, and see really how this has how this how that company has uh, has fared after it uh, after it delisted from the U.S. exchange. Okay, so DD Global, uh, kind of a horror story for for investors, right? Uh, it uh, it listed it had its IPO. Back here in uh, in July, July of 2021, and has just crashed since, right? It crashed. Uh, you know, here it was. Uh, it was $16 per share. It crashed uh, all the way through. You know, it got a delisting notice right around here, I think. And, and then it actually, in March, in March of this year, actually said that it was going to. Uh, it was going to voluntarily delist from the U.S. markets. It was going to take its shares off the U.S. markets. Uh, eventually relist there in Hong Kong. And so, of course, you see here, you know, when it did say that it was going to delist from the uh, from the market, it fell from about four dollars a share all the way to the delisting, which was here in uh, in May, I think, all the way down to about a dollar sixty a share. Right. So DD Global fell 65 percent, uh, you know, when it after it in the two months leading up to its U.S. delisting. But has since almost doubled, hundreds or a dollar, dollar fifty a share here in, uh, you know, in May, it's now up to almost three dollars a share. So what you got to understand about these is if they do delist from the U.S. exchange, if Alibaba can't fix its problems there with the PCAOB, can't fix its problems with the SEC, uh, if it does have to delist from the U.S. exchanges and go to the Hong Kong market you still own those shares and you will still be able to trade those shares. Okay, it's just going to change to the OTC market here in the US. Okay, so a lot of uh, a lot of your platforms, uh, I know E-Trade uh, makes uh, OTC stocks available. There's some of those other platforms that will you'll have access to those stocks uh, on the OTC market. So if it does look like Alibaba is going to delist, uh, then yes, stock price is going to fall. But uh, I think that would be, you know, the perfect time to, to pick up more shares. I'm going to hold my shares just because I think the company is a great company. It's, it's very attractive valuations. But if it does delist, it is going to sell off big time. Uh, but then it, you, what we see a lot of times when these head to the OTC market, then they rebound off of that. Okay, They rebound off of those lows, and, uh, and, and it can be good long-term investments. So again, I, I still do like Alibaba. I think the valuation is very attractive here, uh, but you do have to be watching for that, for that delisting uh, eventuality. Uh, Beyond Meat. 
Beyond Meat reports Thursday, uh, so be watching for that. It is expected, the thing is with Beyond Meat, it's expected to report a loss of $1.18 a share versus loss of just $0.31 cents a share in the same quarter of last year. So they are getting less profitable. They are losing more money. Uh, this The whole year's losses are expected to increase to four, almost $4.50 a share. Uh, that's in, despite revenue growth that's supposed to be up 21%, right? So kind of begs the question, where's the money going? Uh, now, it's not uncommon for a lot of these these startup, fast-growing companies to see their revenue grow but be reporting large losses like this. But, uh, you know, for a company that's, that's well-established, it's, it's, you know, it should be, management should start focusing on profitability. Uh, they got a big, uh, a big hit last week. Uh, shares plunged 13% last week on the failure of the, the McPlant partnership with McDonald's. Okay, so uh, McDonald's was selling that McPlant uh, burger, um, and that just did not do well. So they pulled the McPlant burger off of the uh, off the menus at McDonald's. That hit the shares 13% last week. Um, you know, the, the the company is still the industry the leader in this growing industry, but management has just missed those pros, profit estimates. Right, management has missed its profit estimates, its guidance for four quarters in a row, and uh, investors just really have little faith in this company anymore. In fact. 41% of the shares of Beyond Meat are sold short. So, you know, can you get to a point where uh, they get some good news and you get a short squeeze and the shares just jump? Then yes, you can. But I think there's something to be said if uh, almost half of the shares are sold short. Uh, you know, investors have just such little faith in this company and in this management. Uh, so, you know, I'd be wary of that. They're going to report earnings on Thursday. Again, uh, you know, very volatile company. Uh, around that that short percentage as well as uh, you know just kind of the general direction of the company. Uh, DraftKings DraftKings is expected to report a loss of 83 cents a share on Friday um, on sales growth of 46 percent to 435 million dollars for the quarter. Full full year sales are expected to be higher by 62 percent. Uh, so this is a company. This is a company growing its sales by 62 percent year over year basis. Uh, it is actually reporting a little bit lower loss, so it's actually getting a little bit more profitable. And uh, the, but it also does have higher short interest, 10% of shares available, uh, just in much better position. The company has a strong balance sheet, growing sales that quickly. Uh, you know, after a 78% loss it, it drop in the shares over the last year, these shares are very attractively priced. Okay, the, the DraftKings trading for just three times on a price to sales basis for its full year sales. Uh, management, I think management has a good chance of reporting a surprise revenue uh, just here this this quarter or over the next couple on you know some of those major markets they've just added this year, like New York earlier in this year. Uh, this is actually uh, one of the best performing stocks in our uh, in Amy's Bowtie Nation thousand dollar challenge portfolio. Did a video uh, a couple of weeks ago. Five members of the Bowtie Nation uh, picked their five best stocks. This is uh, this is actually one of the stocks in Amy's portfolio. Uh, it is her best performer right now, and and yeah, I, so I like DraftKings uh, not just coming up to this earnings report, but just on this valuation and growth in general. I want to now look at the uh, the sectors, how the sectors did last week. Of course, here we are in the. Sector tracker on sectorspider.com give you that nice overall uh, top-down picture of the market and uh, you know kind of kind of what to look at what to look for that and we did see uh, ele all 11 sectors closed higher last week so very strong week S and P 500 closed up almost 4.3 percent on the week which is very strong again there is only 10 uh, only 10 other weeks in the past five years that the uh, that the that the S and P five hundred has grown by more than four point three percent. So very strong last week. Consumer staples, uh, only consumer staples and communication services really underperformed last week. So if you look here, uh, consumer communication services only up 068 percent last week. Uh, consumer staples right here only up one point seven percent last week. And now consumer staples, that's obvious, right? Consumer staples, kind of intuitive. Investors focus more on growth uh, during a rally, during those growth sectors. So you, technology, uh, you know, technology, consumer discretionary stocks tend to do well, while those safety sectors like consumer staples kind of falls back, uh, you know, back in the rearview mirror. Uh, consumer communication services is a little different. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, energy led the rally on dollar weakness. Okay, so as the dollar starts weakening, then uh, that rebound in oil prices uh, can go a little bit further. And there's really no end in sight in these uh, this Ukraine conflict. So that's going to support 
oil prices. We talked about that last week. Uh, oil prices probably higher for longer, for at least through this year, as uh, Russia really moves into its best negotiating point here over the winter. Uh, Europe is hurting, folks. Europe is hurting for natural gas and, and for uh, some of these other energy inputs uh, because of that conflict. And uh, Russia just has no, you know, Russia has no reason to negotiate until we get to winter and until really the, uh, you know, really that energy demand really starts to increase here in Europe or there in Europe and, uh, and really give your, uh, Russia more bargaining power. So, you know, I don't see, I don't see any let up in energy prices, at least until maybe January, February, uh, somewhere, somewhere around there. But communication services, uh, really interesting that it didn't rebound last week. Obviously, this is a mix of telecom, traditional media, and social media. But it generally does rise faster when the market rallies, right? Because <clears throat> you've got uh, you've got those internet stocks, you've got social media stocks that tend to rise faster when the uh, when the when the market take, really takes off. You, we didn't see that last week because really of the ad the ad rates and social media and traditional media, right? We saw a 6% 6 slide in shares of Meta platforms. That's the old Facebook. Uh, we saw a lot of these other stocks you know, fall last week, uh, Comcast last week, Charter Communications, a lot of these traditional media stocks, just seeing that slide in ad revenues, right, heading into a recession. You know, so, so what I think you got you to gotta understand here is uh, a lot of these social media stocks, uh, Alphabet did well on its earnings, but, uh, you know, but, but was part of that group. Uh, really, that that weakness in advertising revenues is being felt across the the entire name. Internet, social media, uh, traditional media. That's likely going to continue through the rest of the year. Okay, until companies until companies get a sense that the economy is going to rebound, uh, that they're looking at maybe a stronger 2023. They're going to be holding those advertising budgets back. And a lot of these stocks, these social media as well as the streaming stocks, the traditional media stocks. They're gonna be they're gonna be uh, reporting pretty uh, pretty weak numbers uh, for that. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, you know what else what else I'm watching for this week and then open it up to uh, the the Q and A there. Uh, again, nearly a third of the companies in the S and P 500 are reporting their earnings this week, so a big week for that. Revenue growth again up 12.3 percent for companies in the S and P 500 uh, against earnings growth of just six six percent. So again, folks, if we if you look at that, what is what does that mean? Companies are raising their prices because they're not really seeing demand growth or volume growth. They're seeing uh, that revenue growth of 12 percent just on the fact that they're raising their prices so much. Okay, so prices, you know, prices for a lot of companies going up 10, 15 percent over the last year. Uh, but they're still only able to, to report 6% earnings growth, right? So that means they're eating some of that inflation, some of those inflationary costs. Profitability is decreasing for companies. And that means a couple of things. That one, they're gonna continue to raise prices. They're gonna continue to raise prices until they get that profitability back up to where earnings are growing faster than sales, uh, which, is norm, which is kind of the norm, right? Kind of the, the case as it normally is. Uh, so they're gonna continue to raise prices. Um, the, Earnings are going to be uh, earnings are going to be weak, um, so you're going to continue to see that that weak earnings picture for companies. You're going to continue to see higher inflation than expected, uh, and, and that's really I think that's really going to weigh on the market. Now the market has punished a lot of companies, uh, you know, Meta and Intel for missing those expectations. Uh, really likely to be the case this week, uh, you know, for for individual stocks. So if you are in, investing in individual stocks, watch out for that. You know, especially a lot of these companies that that are getting hit, especially hard on the recession. Uh, again, the monthly jobs report is really what to watch this week. That comes Friday. I think the market can do uh, fairly well until then, really just on the strength of these earnings. But come Friday, we have to see. Okay, what does uh, what does the the U.S. report as far as uh, monthly jobs, right? Expecting 250,000 jobs to be added the last month. That would be a uh, comparison to 370,000 jobs in the month before. So we do start to, to expect the jobs market to soften a little bit and uh, less jobs available. That should, uh, you know, that should start driving the unemployment rate up a little bit. And again, that bad news is actually going to be good news for the market uh, if we do see a softening jobs market, because that means the Fed can maybe slow down its interest rate hikes just a little bit. Uh, again, it's it's hard to see 250,000 jobs though. The the jobs market has been so strong lately over the past you know years really has been so strong that it is hard to see we only added 250,000 jobs in the last month. Uh, they've been higher than expected over the last couple of months. We've had uh, higher than expected jobs reports every single month. Uh, so you know I think there's there's the there's the risk 
that uh, we report higher than 250,000 jobs this Friday, and the market takes that as a negative sign that the Fed is going to have to continue to raise rates aggressively. Um, so I do want to turn this over into the uh, to the question and answer session. I'm uh, going to look through and see some of those uh, some some of those questions that we have there in the uh, in the comments. I, I saw a couple of comments about Zuckerberg here. Um, what else? Okay, so I, I do see a, a question on Teladoc. Uh, actually, I just just zoomed past it, so so I don't know who asked it. But but question on Tel Teladoc. Obviously, all you out there in the nation know it's one of my largest holdings. Uh, it's a it's a stock I continue to hold. I think it's got a great future. We had a horrible uh, you know a horrible earnings release there here in the last week. The stock fell something like twenty eight percent. Uh, the problem is what you got to lo look at when you get these earnings reports. You got to look at what it actually means for the business and what the business is actually doing. Okay, when Teladoc reported, they reported like a three billion dollar impairment on their assets, uh, on their goodwill, on their intangible assets. Really affects in no way affects how the company is actually performing right now. They actually beat their earnings estimates. Uh, you know, for the uh, for earnings, they did very well on sales growth, uh, slowing down a little bit. There is some competition out there in the market for that virtual healthcare, but they are fairly reporting uh, reporting fairly strong sales growth. Something like twenty around twenty percent year over year sales growth. Uh, so the company is still growing. Is still a growth stock. Uh, you know, or is still a growth company, growing its revenue that fast. Um, the problem with this this impairment with the intangibles is during the pandemic, they, the management said, okay, hey, we've got this goodwill. We made these acquisitions in other companies, and we think the company, we paid this much. Uh, we think the company is worth so much more. So we're going to put that on our balance sheet as this value, right? And since you can't really measure that that intangible value, that that uh, you know that that market value or that value of a stock beyond its market value, then they put that in a special account on the balance sheet called goodwill or called intangible assets. Right? It's something you really can't measure, but you think that's how much that how much that acquisition or that company that you acquire that you bought is worth. Well, now they're saying, you know what, maybe it's not worth quite so much. Maybe we overestimated how much that's worth. So we have to take that money off of the balance sheet. We have to, we have to say, okay, you know what, the company, its assets, it's not worth that much because we overestimated this chunk, right? So they take that, you know, it, it reports a huge, uh, a huge earnings per share loss in the quarter uh, because they have to adjust, you know, adjust the financial statements for that. But it really doesn't have any effect on how the company is actually growing, how the company is operating right now as we see it. Okay, so I, I think you know the sell-off was way overdone last week on that. Uh, I again, I continue to hold the shares. I think Teladoc is is the undisputed leader in virtual healthcare, and and that's the direction healthcare is going. Okay, Amazon acquired one main uh, or or one medical last over the last couple of weeks, uh, trying to get into that virtual healthcare space as well. You know, of course, Amazon has tried to do this in the past, has started up its own healthcare companies, has failed. Now it's starting to try to acquire companies to try to try to compete. Uh, but but it's a lot harder than, than I think Amazon really, really understands. Uh, again, Teladoc is the undisputed leader in that industry. It's a growing industry. Teladoc is expected to continue to grow its sales by 20% a year. Uh, so so I think, you know, this is a, this is a long-term stock to hold. It's a growth company. And I think the valuation is going to come back on that. So I hold the stock. You know, I, I, I've continued to dollar cost average into it. I think right now, even after last week's sell-off, I'm down, I'm down uh, 20, 27%. On the shares okay so even after last week's sell-off i started buying in january february added some more shares in uh, in here in june uh you know may and june added some more shares in the into the portfolio and that to dollar cost average down and uh you know i i continue to like the stock what else uh <clears throat> Just scrolling through here. If I don't see your question, uh, go ahead and ask it again in the comments. Uh, make sure you use the question mark so I can see that it is a, a question there, and I can see and I can find it. Jeez, I'm just oh, geez. scammers. Beware of scammers in the uh, you know in the in the uh, in the comments there. Uh, what else? Uh, I remember double checking the likes, Jeppy. 
Hoping noodles are safe. Uh, so, you know, some of these stocks I just haven't looked at, so I really can't tell you a whole lot. Uh, Dollar, Dollar J70 says Tampa rent rates have ballooned 60%. Yeah, believe me, we've seen it. Okay, we're, we're, we're looking to, to move. Like I said, we're looking to move the end of this month. Uh, we're going to be moving to Tampa. Um, and the last two years, we've been looking at houses to buy. And of course, I've seen just the sky, the prices just skyrocket on that. But even, even rent rates, you know, we'll probably rent for the first six months to a year. And, and those have just, just been insane. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, it's no income tax. So, so yeah, cat cat wants to know why everyone is moving to Florida. It's, it's no income tax. You know, it's, it's, if you're, if you're comparing living in California, you know, which we also like, I love San Diego, but if you're looking at the state income tax rate on that versus not having to pay it in Florida, that is, that is a hard adjustment to make. Right. Uh, you know, and yeah, you do have other rates of uh, property taxes are higher. Insurance is higher in Florida compared to a lot of other States, but, uh, you know, not having to pay those state income taxes. I, I think that's the case in uh, Texas as well. Uh, so a lot of those States, you know, where people are moving to, it is uh, a lot of times it is because of those tax rates. Okay. What else? Uh, uh, R wants to know about GM, you know, GM, uh, as well as you know, a lot of these other legacy makers, car makers, I, I continue to like them. A lot of these Ford, GM, uh, even to Toyota have fallen so much since those highs uh, earlier this year uh, because, you know, EV has sold off, growth stocks have sold off, uh, but but they're still, they've still got that, that future in electric vehicles, okay? Maybe they're not the dominant leader, uh, you know, as Tesla is, but a lot of these companies, Ford and GM specifically, have some strong EV uh, EV offerings. They've still got that uh, you know that 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 roadmap to uh, to electric vehicles, and I think the valuations are looking really good here for those legacy legacy automakers. <clears throat> what else? Uh, to, to, to see. A lot of comments on Florida in the in the chat. There, love the the back and forth there. Uh, you know, among everyone. Okay, no force of access. Seen a report that Pelosi is in Taiwan. Gold and silver went up. I was <clears throat> okay. So Troy, Troy says that I'm a little skeptical because gold and silver went up with the rate hike. I was under the impression that gold and silver do not do well with higher interest rates. And you're right. Uh, normally, higher interest rates do hold gold and silver and commodity. Uh, you know those those commodities down uh, because uh, when you hold gold. When you, when you buy gold, you don't receive anything for it until you sell it again, right? There's no return until you sell your gold if you hold physical gold, right? Well, you know, well, when interest rates go up, then you've got another option. You've got another something else that you can invest in that's fairly safe, you know, bonds or, or other yielding uh, rate sensitive investments where if those rates go up, then you're earning more. So that is an opportunity cost for holding gold. Uh, if you're not earning anything while these rates are going up, you're not earning anything in gold, uh, then that tends to bring the price of gold down. The problem is, is there are other factors uh, at, at, at work here. There are other factors that, that weigh, uh, weigh or support on gold prices. And what we saw last week was the falling dollar. The dollar fell, I think, something like 3% or, or so in the, in the week. Uh, I'd have to check that on the dollar index. But the value of the U.S. dollar is very important for gold and, and other commodities because they're valued, they're priced in dollars. Okay, we trade gold, you know, uh, $1,700 per ounce. We trade oil, $100 per barrel, okay? So because those are valued in dollars, but they're international commodities, then as the dollar weakens, then uh, then that drives up the price, right? Because you know a, a barrel of oil, uh, an ounce of gold is still worth the same amount, uh, you know, in Dubai or in France or in wherever it is. Uh, but if the dollar is weaker, then you have to pay more dollars to buy that that same ounce or that same barrel. Okay. So as the dollar weakens, then you see some support for a lot of these commodities, for oil, for gold. We saw that last week with those. Now, now you've got to you you kind of got to look at it and say, okay, what are the stronger forces? Okay, our interest rates going to go up so much that it's going to pull investors out of gold. Is the market going to rally so much that it is going to uh, it is going to give investors uh, other opportunities outside of gold outside of that safe haven investment uh, and th that going to do it or is the dollar going to fall so much that it is going to support the price right what we're seeing with gold right now uh, we've been seeing over the last year really in that range bound between uh, 1700 per ounce all the way up to you know maybe 1900 per ounce i think it's right around uh it was right around eighteen hundred dollars right now maybe a little less 1766 so kind of the lower end of that range 
I do think it stays range bound, right? Uh, depends on what we see with inflation, but I, I really see it staying range bound. So again, I kind of I like the miners a little bit, be a lot better than physical gold. You know, instead of holding like the GLD uh, gold ETF, which doesn't pay anything while you hold it, then I would buy the miners because you know they're going to be able to leverage those prices into profits, pay out some of those as dividends. So you're at least collecting some dividends while you wait for for gold prices to go higher. Okay, uh, Alan. Alan Lemus wants to know what I think about AMC. I try not to, really. No, I mean, come on. The problem with AMC, the problem with, uh, I mean, you got two problems here. One is the meme stocks are just, you know, built up so much. And that's actually kind of supporting, right? I, I mean, if so many people are, are watching these stocks and, and still interested in them, that can support the price. But the problem with AMC is what's the business model? I mean, the business model is in, in such distress right now, right? Even as even as people get out to the to, to the theaters and start watching movies uh, outside of the home again, you've still got an immense competition from streaming. You've still got some people that are worried about uh, COVID and the pandemic and stuff and not going out as much as they used to. And uh, theaters are just in a bad situation, right? So, so it's going to be hard to see any kind of revenue growth or, or revenue uh, volume like you saw pre-pandemic anyway. Uh, but then you also have to look at what these companies had to do to survive the pandemic, to survive the last couple of years. They put on tens of billions of dollars worth of debt, right? So a lot of these companies, they're zombie companies, man. There are a lot of zombie companies out there. You got to really got to look at the balance sheet and say, okay, you know, how much debt does, uh, does AMC have? How much debt does GameStop have? How much, how much debt does, uh, you know, does, does Carnival Cruise Lines and some of those other cruise lines have? Uh, and what are the interest payments going to be on that? And are they even going to be able to pay those interest payments? You're right. That is going to be a, a big weight, you know, on the on the earnings of these companies, those interest payments on all that debt that they've put on over the last couple of years. So, you know, if the if the industry is rebounding, uh, you know, cruise lines are, are doing marginally better. Uh, some of these other industries that were hit by the uh, you know airlines are doing better. But some of these industries like uh, you know, like, like, like theaters, like movie, uh, you know, movie traffic just has not rebounded and likely won't. You know, I've been actually looking at our, our HBO Max subscription over the last week, and they have a surprising amount of movies available. Uh, we've got Disney Plus as well. And, uh, you know, just for just for Marvel and Star Wars, right, but I'm not really interested in a lot of the other stuff on Disney Plus. And, and it's got, you know, kind of a limited selection, it looks like other than kind of TV. Uh, but you look at HBO Max, and they've got everything. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just convinced it's surprisingly uh, harder to convince myself to go to the theaters when I have all these movies available, you know, through a streaming service. So I think movies are going to be are going to be weak. Uh, AMC is going to be weak uh, along with it. Okay, what else? Uh, Paragraphy. Quantum scheme. Uh, thinking about buying some Citigroup. So Michael, Michael wants to know. Thinking about buying some Citigroup. What do you think? I love Citigroup. I own Citigroup on my own portfolio. I've got it in our uh, Bowtie Nation portfolio, uh, 2022 Bowtie Nation portfolio. We got a big boost on the earnings, uh, but I think it's still a very good valuation on Citigroup. Uh, as well as a lot of the other bank stocks, I'm still very bullish on the bank stocks. They've been hit hard over this last uh, over the last six months in the recession or in the sell-off. And what you got to understand about bank stocks is uh, these financials and these interest rate sensitive stocks uh, like financials they tend to sell off first. You know, anytime we we have a stock market crash or heading into a recession, right? Because you know, investors are trying to look further out, trying to say, okay, you know what, if we do get a recession, loan defaults are going to increase, uh, loan demand is going to decrease. So the, the financials and the, especially the bank stocks, they tend to sell off first, right? But what, we, what you also got to understand is with the Fed increasing interest rates so fast, uh, we could be heading into what is some of the best net interest margin, the best profitability for the banks that we've seen since, since like the 80s. OK, so over the next couple of years, banks are going to make so much more money on their loans than they have over the past decade, really over the past couple of decades that, uh, you know, a lot of these banks are very attractive valuations, I think. Um, you know, they are. Yes. In a recession, we do see lower demand growth. We do see higher demand default or loan defaults. So lower, lower de loan demand, higher loan defaults. But one, I don't think it's nearly going to be nearly as bad as people are predicting. OK, if the recession isn't, uh, you know, just as bad as 2008, then we won't get the kind of loan defaults at banks that they're expecting. They are already putting tens of billions of dollars 
onto their balance sheet as a protection against that in their loan loss reserves. They're already moving uh, money from their income statement, from their earnings onto their that cash that cash reserve, which is why the earnings for banks have been so bad because they're moving a lot of this cash off of their income statement, off of their earnings, uh, and they're reporting lower earnings, right? Well, you know, of course, same thing we saw during the pandemic when they started to do that during the pandemic. Then eventually when they found out, okay, loan defaults aren't as bad as they thought, they've got all this money that they can then move back into their earnings and, and earnings just jumped, okay? Bank stocks were, were one of the best sectors, one of the best industries in uh, 2021, right? Because because of that uh, because of that dynamic. So that's really what I'm watching for bank stocks. I like Citigroup. Uh, I like some of the other larger banks. Uh, you know, J.P. Morgan is always a good one. Uh, Bank of America as well is is fairly good valuation. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, those are day trade. Trying just looking through more of the stocks or the questions here. Trying to find questions. Uh, love chat X Y Z. Come on, uh, I mean, watch out for the scammers and the you know the the people trying to promote their own shitty little websites in in the chat chat here, folks. Uh, greetings from Israel. What do you think about OMF? Uh, sorry, I haven't looked at OMF. Uh, One Main Financial, I believe. It's a uh, you know it's a, a BDC business development corporation, so it's not necessarily a financial bank company, right? Uh, so I would have to I would have to look at that. Uh, <clears throat> what else? Once people discovered all the processing, financial advisor, DraftKings. What did you fail? Okay. Uh, what about ConocoPhillips? So, uh, so uh, Sapoc wants to know about ConocoPhillips. So, I want to cover kind of the broader energy stocks uh, companies. Now, obviously, we've seen a huge, huge returns in the energy stocks. Ten percent up last week alone in energy stocks. Uh, so, of course, everyone's asking, you know, how long can energy prices stay high? There is no reason that oil should be at a hundred dollars a barrel if we're heading into a recession. There's just is just not the demand. Uh, but the problem here is obviously the Ukraine conflict and Russia. Russia accounts for a large chunk of the global oil uh, oil market. So as long as there are those sanctions on Russian oil, uh, then uh, then oil prices will be higher. And again, you know, I think there is just no reason for Russia to negotiate until we head into Jan January or February or March. Okay, until until those winter heating months really get bad for Europe. And uh, and gives Russia more of a you know more power in those negotiations. Okay, you know, uh, the Russia just just does not have any motivation to negotiate until they see their their negotiating power as high as it could be. And that is not going to be until you know the worst of the winter heating months uh, when Germany is having to turn off the lights because they don't have enough uh, natural gas to heat. Uh, when they're you know we're actually seeing Germany tell uh, you know tell tell consumers to to limit their natural gas use. Uh, to really conserve that that for the winter heating months, uh, we're ask, seeing them asking industrial users to cut down on their power usage, right? To to conserve gas and conserve electricity and that kind of thing. So uh, you know it it could get really bad in uh, you know not just Germany, which is the powerhouse economic powerhouse of Europe, but across Europe. Uh, and so really that that really uh, really increases Russia's Russia's hand at at that negotiating table against Ukraine. Uh, so I just I just don't see uh, you know I don't see any reason for them to negotiate or a uh, any any optimism in the Ukraine conflict you know until then. Uh, what else? So so you know with that said, I, I mean I do like the the energy stocks like Conoco Phillips. Really, Chevron is is probably my favorite energy stock. It has been for quite a while. Uh, I think you, you buy those, you get that dividend, and, and the stock price is going to be is going to be fairly consistent uh, against whatever the market does. Uh, <clears throat> What else? Lifters Gym. Uh, Chad, good to see you here. Uh, if you had to trim one or two sectors of your portfolio, which would you choose and why? That is a tough one. So let's uh, let's go back here. Let's go to the uh, the sectors, the stock sectors. Again, this is the sector tracker of selectsectorspider.com or sectorspider.com, uh, the sector tracker. Let's look at year to date here. So again, energy stock up, energy stocks up 40% so far this year. But I think you know while while the gains have probably been put in place for energy stocks, I think they can still be pretty resilient uh, just on those energy prices. And the uh, you know the 
the dividends on energy stocks are just excellent, right? So I would keep energy stocks. Um, the trim, I, I'd say I would I would start looking at uh, communication services. So some of those uh, social media stocks are excellent valuations right now. Um, about financials, again, I, I'm heavy into financials. If I was trimming one or two sectors, I think I would have to look at uh, technology, right? Uh, I would look at technology and then, uh, you know, maybe maybe utilities, right? And what I'm looking at here, again, is something like that barbell strategy, right? Where I don't want to, I don't want to be selling out of all of the growth stocks. I don't want to be selling out of all the growth names. But then again, you know, I don't want to have be too heavily focused just on uh, the safety stuff, right? So while I might be trimming my technology bets, then I'm still holding on to consumer discretionary, right? Which has fallen 20% so far this year is very growthy, right? Uh, if the market continues to rebound, consumer discretionary is going to do very well. Um, so I'm trimming, you know, some of those growth, but still holding on to some of the other ones. Uh, on the other side of the of it, though, not really holding, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to sell my utility stocks, but I'm keeping my consumer staples. Okay, so I think I think consumer staples can hold up very well during a recession. We already saw the pain with inflation for a lot of those stocks last year. Uh, they're now starting to increase their prices and make up some of that profitability. Uh, so, you know, if the market does continue to fall and I need some of that safety sector bets, then I hold on to consumer staples, but I sell the utilities, right? So I sell, so I have a little bit of cash, uh, you know, cash from those. Uh, but I do have, you know, some growth stocks, I have some util some safety sector stocks, and I have some cash. Uh, that's probably what I would be looking at. Okay, so, so uh, you know, trimming maybe utilities, maybe technology uh, to get, uh, you know, to, to, to get, uh, get, raise a little bit of cash at the margins there. Uh, again, I still like energy, I still like financials, healthcare uh, outside of biotech can still do very well in a recession, uh, as well as some of those stocks in the consumer services or communication services sector, uh, especially the, you know, the, the social media stocks that have hit so hard, and will eventually see those, uh, you know, see those ad rates increasing back again. Uh, so great question there by uh, by Chad there. <clears throat> what else? I'm putting on multiple stocks in energy sector. Uh, <clears throat> so love chat is still trying to spam our uh our our chat here i'm gonna hide the user in this chat what else uh so so yeah i mean k2 DraftKings is a buy yeah i i'd like DraftKings. i think they are a great a great growth stock a great uh and the valuation is still is looking pretty attractive again you know this is a company growing its sales on a year over year basis by like 60%. Okay. And it's not profitable yet. Uh, but it is, uh, it is moving into all the right markets, dominating that, uh, that on online gambling and sports betting uh, theme. And I think you get some good news uh, from from that stock, you know, here over the next couple of quarters. We talked about done investing in AMC, but what about the studios like, okay, so Bishop wants to know about, uh, you know, some of the studios, like, so like those media companies, Fox, Disney, uh, Sony, uh, I do like Disney, uh, just on the rebound in uh, you know in theme parks as well as streaming. Uh, Disney Plus, it's a it's a quality streaming service. I do like it, uh, and I think you know they've got pretty sticky customers there. Uh, where you know we'll always pay for Disney just because of the Marvel movies, right? The Marvel movies and the Star Wars movies. Uh, so you know it doesn't doesn't matter uh, even if we're not watching it quite as much as some of those others. So I do like Disney. It sold off huge this year. Um, you know, since the peak. So I think it's a, a good valuation there. Haven't looked at Sony uh, quite as much or uh, or some of the others, Universal, Fox. Uh, I do, you know, I do, I, I do know uh, AOL and the, uh, you know, the spinoff from at and I, I would probably look at that, look back at that once again, Discovery. Uh, it's, I think it's Discovery AOL is, is trading now. And what I like about that is they've got, you know, some, uh, one part of the business that is that, you know, entertainment, uh, movies, that kind of thing. But the other part, the discovery, uh, streaming part is fairly easy to easy or fairly lower cost to produce. And that's really my main worry about streaming services, you know, Netflix, Disney, um, that, uh, you know, that discover, discover AOL, that, 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 that one, uh, because the content is getting so expensive. It is just a race, you know, a race to produce content for these streaming services. 
And that's really what we saw with Netflix. You know, their their profitability has just plunged uh, because of you know because of that cost of content to c- produce so much more content and so much more competition in that. So I would really be looking at the streamers that are able to produce that content uh, on a little bit lower a little bit lower cost, like like Discovery. What else? Uh, <clears throat> you've spoken about commodities. <laughs> Yep, Warner Warner Brothers Discovery. Okay, so so watching Warner Brothers Discovery, uh, you know they, they've got that HBO Max, which again I am surprised at the uh, the the amount of content they have in there, and, and that's really I think that's really going to be a competitive advantage for uh, for Warner Brothers Discovery is you know having that huge backlog of uh, of movies and of content. That, that is going to hold people there. You know, I'm a, we're working A through Z on the movies, and, and it's going to be forever before we we see all the movies we want to see. So we're gonna we're gonna hold that streaming service. We're gonna keep that streaming service, whereas we might drop some some others, uh, as well as you know the the fact that Discovery is a little bit cheaper to produce. They're going to be able to produce that content uh, a little bit cheaper than you know maybe con- versus Netflix, which everything is is you know tens of millions of dollars to produce or, or more, hundreds of millions of dollars. Can you do two stocks? Yeah. AOLs, dirty word, business circles. These. <clears throat> what else? Uh, t- t- just looking through here, looking for more questions uh, that I didn't get to. Something for Amazon and One Medical. Um, so Jesse wants to know about Amazon and One Medical. You know, I, I guess in relation to Teladoc. Uh, uh, again, you know, I mean, it's hard to it's hard to to over it's hard to overestimate Amazon. I mean, they've just done so well. But they have failed at healthcare. They have failed at healthcare multiple times. They're buying one medical, I guess, trying to get a foothold in medical and, and virtual healthcare, you know, rather than try to develop it on their own. But again, they have failed at it so many times that you know it's it's hard to see them being able to compete quite as much with with like Teladoc, which is you know the the leader in the space. So I still like Teladoc better. Obviously, the market is a little bit worried about that that. That competition from Amazon and One Medical now, but but I still do like Telecom or Teladoc as the leader in that uh, in that growth market. Okay, cold storage. Uh, so cash is trash. Says I store Bitcoin on cold storage wallet, uh, which which is what you got to do. I think you know I've still got some money on uh, on BlockFi as well as a little bit on Coinbase. Uh, you know some of my Bitcoin and, and Ethereum there, but you really need to be transferring that to a cold storage wallet, folks, because you know that that just ensures guarantees that your that your Bitcoin, that your Ethereum, that your cryptocurrencies are safe away from these platforms. That you know, like we've seen with Celsius, like we've seen with uh, some of these other platforms, if they go under, they take your money with them. They take your coin your your coins with them. So transfer transfer your stuff to a wallet, to a cold storage wallet. Okay, scrolling back through here, what are some of the favorite REITs with good fundamentals? Okay, uh, REITs, uh, real estate investment trusts. You know, I mean, I continue to like the uh, I, I continue to like the industrial REITs. They've sold off a little bit, so Stag Industrial or uh, uh, ticker STAG. I like that one. I like uh, Medical Properties as a ticker MPW. It's a healthcare REIT. There, they do a triple net lease. So basically, the uh, the facilities and, and whoever's running the facilities are going to pay all the expenses on those. They have a rent, uh, an inflation escalator in those leases, so they keep up with inflation. And, and healthcare, it's a it's a very strong, you know, very strong, very safe and, and stable uh, sector, right? So so medical properties, MPW is very good. Stag, I, I like that one. Uh, you know, probably two of my two of my favorite right now uh, on on the REITs. But but yeah, you know, REITs, REITs are the kind of thing, those real estate investment trusts, they're the kind of thing, it's not going to make you rich, but it is it is a great low stress uh, investment, right? Higher, high dividend yield, uh, you know, the uh, they're, these are real assets, so they're going to be able to hold up against inflation. So, you know, all, all investors, even if even if you don't have the money to buy commercial property or buy property directly, you need some real estate exposure, and you're going to get it with these real estate investment trusts with these REITs. Uh, so great, great sector to, to be in. Awesome. 
Okay, we've got uh, thoughts on, from Mike. Thoughts on Meta. Uh, Kat says she's she's stumped on Meta as well. Facebook, right? The old Meta. I I still have problems calling it Meta. Come on, folks. It's Facebook, right? Uh, but they have changed their ticker to M E T A Meta Platforms. Uh, and, and again, you know, with these with these social media stocks, especially Meta, especially Meta platforms, you got to ask yourself: Are you really using them less? Yeah, I'm mean, we're just as much dependent on these social media platforms, especially Meta, than than we ever were. Um, one thing, the what I like about Meta as well is it's ju not just a single platform. You know, you buy Twitter, you buy Snap, you buy Pinterest. Uh, you've only got the one platform, okay? With Meta, you've got Instagram, you've got WhatsApp, and you've got the the Facebook platform, right? So you have got a very strong uh, more you know scope. A scope of of, uh, of business rather than just the scale, uh, which again you know is is beyond these other platforms as well. Meta is is the largest social media platform in the world, uh, Facebook at, at, you know Facebook alone. So you've got a scale and a scope that just can't be touched by these other platforms. I think that gives it you know, gives it the competitive advantage you know in these social media platforms. Obviously, right now uh, they are just facing an ad an ad revenue apocalypse. Uh, you know, ad revenue and ad rates have gone down so much over the last six months uh, on a year over year basis that it's really hurting the stock. Uh, obviously, the iPhone uh, or the, the Apple changes to Apple privacy have hurt these stocks and, and have hurt their, their targeting with the ad rates. But those are all temporary problems. OK, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that Facebook, that all these social media platforms are going to be able to figure out a way to return to the targeting they kind of they used to do with ads. Um, and get beyond those Apple privacy changes. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that eventually the economy is going to pick back up, and those ad rates are going to be go going back up. Okay, you know, ads, uh, uh, internet ads, ad rates are, have, are only on the upward trend. Right, we're spending more money online than we ever were, and we'll continue to do that. So, internet advertising is only going to increase in value. Uh, so, you know, I think you look at some of these stocks, especially Meta, and uh, and it is a value time to buy. Okay, these are a very attractive prices. Obviously, it hurts to see the stocks fall fall by so much, but you got to have that long term mentality. You got to have that long term focus on these. Like you really getting that dividend. What else? Uh, METV. So yeah, I don't know about Meta owning METV. I don't know what METV is. I'd have to check that. Uh, <clears throat> what else? Uh, t -t 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 just trying to look through here. I see a lot of a lot of people talking about QYLD, which you know, I mean, QYLD is 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 okay. I've I've been down on the uh, on the fund a, a few times just because you know it tends to lose. Uh, to, to lose value. Uh, if you're not never selling it, then yeah, you're going to coll keep collecting dividends. But, you know, think about your own portfolio and how long you've sold, how long you've held any of the stocks in your portfolio. None of them are, for most investors, none of them are more than, you know, five or 10 years old. Okay. So can you really say that you're never going to sell QYLD or, or one of these stocks? You know, so if you do end up selling it, you're going to take a big loss on that stock and it's going to wipe out a lot of the dividends that you collected. Uh, so not only are you paying taxes every single year on those dividends, but you're going to take a loss on the share. So, you know, I just I just like some other income investments rather than the QYLD, um, you know, some of them that, that that don't have that that losing uh, losing share price. I actually did a video, you know, five income ETFs better than the QYLD a couple of uh, a couple of months ago. So so check for that. Okay, uh, so IMJ uh, wants to know opinions on Verizon. Concerned that it's the new AT and T. We say it's great, but it's just not producing in reality. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I haven't looked at Verizon in a while. I actually own shares of AT and T, uh, so maybe a little bit biased there. But uh, yeah, all the telecoms are down over the last year. They, they've had a tough environment with the spending to to uh, for that five G environment or that five G spending and the capital expenditures it's required. I do, you know, I do like them. Uh, I, I like the telecoms here. I think they they see that rebound as the revenues come in from 5G. Again, I'm I'm a little bit more overweight or, or more bullish on AT&T just because 
I think the valuation is better for AT&T than for Verizon or some of these other telecoms. I think AT&T has been beaten so badly over the last couple of years, and rightfully so. Management has just been horrible on AT&T with all those acquisitions. But with this change in focus this year for AT&T, you know, since it sold off DirecTV, since it sold off uh, AOL and Warner and all, all that, then they've they've refocused back on telecom, and I think the shares are still value still attractive, and I think you know that renewed focus really comes through in cash flows and dividend and that kind of thing for AT and T. Uh, Verizon, I think you you could still do well, but but I just prefer AT and T on that instead. Dividends is new and will accept T Mobile. Uh, yeah, you know, T-Mobile, Verizon, all of those telecom stocks, uh, they're going to they're gonna treat you better in a recession. You know, they're, they're going to be more stable, stable cash flows. I think AT&T did report the customers are paying, uh, paying two days later than, than they were. Uh, so customers are starting to, to pay a little bit later, but, but not late. Uh, so, so that's really what I, what I wanted to see in that AT&T earnings report is, yeah, customers are paying later, but are they paying late yet? Are they dropping their subscriptions? That kind of thing. They're, they don't seem to be dropping subscriptions or anything like that. They're just paying a couple of days later. So not necessarily a problem just yet with the consumers with uh, with telecom names anyway. Uh, Christian, hi, hi from Chile. How are you doing? Uh, good to see you here. Uh, not using Facebook less. I'm just getting flagged more. Nice. Okay. Um, how did you get your... How much did you get your mic? Uh, it's a Blue Yeti mic. It's a couple years old, actually. I think it's I think it was like one hundred twenty dollars or something. It might be cheaper now. Uh, but yeah, this is you know kind of the the, the main podcasting mic over the last uh, really over the last decade. I think you know a lot of people are using a little bit higher end mics now, but but this used to be the big one that, that people used to buy. <clears throat> what else? Uh, thoughts on monthly pairs now. <clears throat> Okay, trying to find a, a couple of, the, I mean, some of these stocks like Solana, uh, you know, I, I just, I can't can't really say much on it because I, I've really never looked at the stock. Uh, SLNH, I've never looked at the stock. So so it's really hard to, to give you uh, any kind of information one way or the other. I don't want to give you just a, a quick, you know, 30 second, uh, you know, 30 second read on it if, if I really don't know, don't know what I'm talking about on the stock. I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm not going to. Not going to try to talk you into or out of a stock that I don't know about. So I'm going to try to uh, read through some of these here. Not really seeing anything else. Uh, <clears throat> okay, last time. Okay, Kat says last time she was in the Best Buy, the shelves were empty, that, and that is that is interesting. Uh, a lot of companies having having inventory problems. Uh, you know, so that is weird that. Uh, you know, they wouldn't be able to handle that. It's, it's obviously Best Buy had a, a horrific. Uh, Earnings report last week. I think it took the shares down last week. Uh, you know, so they've really been getting hit in this in this uh, in this sell off. Uh, so I would be, yeah, I would be cautious for that if I'm still, if you're still seeing Best Buy shelves uh, empty. Uh, JD wants to know how much whiskey is too much in your coffee. None. There's never too much. Okay. Uh, I've got my actually I worked through my Jack Daniels last week with the uh, with my my Friday Twilight Zone episode so I've got to buy more uh, more Jack Daniels this week uh, ahead of Friday. What else? Uh, see, I see some comments. We, we've talked about uh, you know Intel. We talked about that earlier. AGNC is another mortgage REIT. We talked about that earlier. Again, these mortgage REITs, you got to understand they're very cyclical. They crash hard in that rate environment, but they uh, you know they're they're long term investments, right? The AGNC investments, one of the largest mortgage REITs out there. Uh, so which you know if you're if you're worried about the short term. You gotta you you've got to make sure you pick them up at these lower valuations and you sell at you, you know you sell when the stocks take off because they are gonna jump around a lot. If you're longer term, you buy them anytime. You dollar cost average month after month and you you collect those dividends and they do well because they're gonna be around. There's always gonna be a demand for mortgage REITs for mortgages things like that. Um, so so you know you continue to invest, but understand what you're investing in, how they react to those mortgage rates and the mortgage rate environment. Uh, what else? Uh, the the uh, I think I saw Roblox in there. Uh, yeah, I saw Roblox in there. Uh, you know, Roblox is tough. Roblox is a tough one because it has come down so much. Valuation is looking better, but it's still incredibly expensive. So it still really uh, really scares me. You know, Roblox is obviously a growth company. It's obviously really interesting uh, on that that part of the market. The uh, the user generated content. 
uh, obviously is has been one of the themes over the last couple of decades really and probably in into the future is that that user generated content like Facebook like these social media platforms that get people to to generate their own content for them right the, to to uh, to to engage uh, and, and really keep those sites alive uh, now Roblox is using that as for software for gaming and things like that so it's really an innovative new concept uh, but the stock is just so expensive still even after the sell-off so I would still I would continue to watch it but uh, but I would, uh, you know, I would, I would be cautious about buying shares, uh, you know, as it is, as it is right now. Okay, over here, I'm gonna buy and hold, or, the, or should they try harder and build and sell their portfolio? Uh, Neophyte, Neophyte Stacker wants to know: Would you recommend beginning investors buy and hold, or should they try to buy and sell and build their portfolio? I would, you know, honestly, folks, I love to buy to to pick stocks and to try to find where the market is going and kind of, you know, strategy and all that. But buy and hold is going to be your best bet. Is always going to be the best investing strategy. And I'll tell you a couple of reasons why. Right? One is because buy and hold it is just so much lower stress. You you don't need to do any analysis. You just buy the indexes. Maybe you buy a few ETFs, a, a few uh, stocks that you really like, and just buy those. Keep buying them month after month, and you don't have to worry about anything. It, it frees up your time to do what you do best to make money. Okay. If you make money, you know, in your regular job, or you can do a side hustle or passive income, you're going to make a hell of a lot more money than you would trying to pick stocks uh, back and forth every month and that kind of thing, right? So just, you know, find a good portfolio that you really like, you can hold that forever and just continuously invest in that and don't worry about the market. And I realize that's going to mean less viewers for my videos. But that is just how it is. That is the best investing style. Just find those you know, like we core satellite strategy we talk about here on the channel, buy an index fund, buy three to five ETFs in themes you like, dividends or growth or, or you know, value stocks, something, something like that, give you that market exposure in that core part of your portfolio. And then maybe, maybe 10 or 15 stocks that you really like, you're really going to hold them for 10 or 15 or 20 years and just keep investing in those. Don't even worry about the market, right? so much uh, easier, so much more stress-free and simple, uh, and just do that, right? And then again, you know, spend your time that you would have spent researching the market on a side hustle or a passive income and use that money to, re to invest more in the market. Okay, for 99% of the people out there, that's gonna be the best way. Now, why I still pick stocks, why I still think a lot of people, you know, why I still give investing advice on, you know, picking stocks and talk about the best stocks to pick, because I'm an addict. Okay, and I know a lot of you out there are addicts as well. Okay, and what I mean by that, you know, I'm not addicted to crack, but I'm addicted to watching the stock market and watching stocks and trying to pick those stocks and and uh, and kind of following that part of the market, right? So I know that if I didn't have any of them, any of my portfolio dedicated to this kind of shorter term strategy to, to picking the best stocks or, or to, okay, what are the market doing over the next six months or over the next year? And how can I use that to my advantage in a strategy? If I didn't have that with, 10 or 15 or 20 percent of my portfolio then i would just muck things up i would just screw the whole portfolio up because i, I would be selling some of these long-term uh investments right you know i have that need that that addiction okay so to speak to to be in the market to to buy and sell stocks and uh you know and to follow the markets i enjoy it right so i have to have 10 or 15 or 20 percent of my entire wealth of my portfolio in stocks that I can do that with to scratch that itch. And I know a lot of people out there are like that, you know, so I want to help you uh, do a better job at doing that with that small part of your portfolio. Keep the rest of your portfolio, keep most of your money in those funds, in those index funds, in those ETFs, in those long term stocks, keep most of your money in there to get the stress free returns, but then have a little bit of money on the side that you can you can play with, you scratch that itch, and, and you don't screw up the rest of your portfolio. That's why I pick stocks. That's why I do stock picking videos because I enjoy it so much. But yes, uh, if you are someone that, that can just sit out the market, buy those funds, buy those long-term stocks, just do that. You know, just concentrate on what you do best to make money. Uh, and then watch the, watch, the, watch the videos because you like the bow tie anyway. Okay, so um, great live stream today. I actually have to, uh, I've got a podcast interview here at uh, in 20 minutes that I have to get to. So thank you everybody again for joining us. Uh, I love doing these kind of face-to-face -face connections we get with the live stream. Uh, and, and I will see you next week.